Revelations uh, chapter 1, verse 9 and 10. Uh, if you have your Bibles, go ahead and get those out and turn to Revelations chapter 1, uh, verse 9. We're going to be breaking these verses down into phrases, so if you have your Bible, it'll be a lot easier for you to go back as we break these verses down. Revelations uh, chapter 1, verse 9 reads, I, John, who also am your brother and companion in tribulation and in the kingdom and patience of Jesus Christ was in the isle that is called Patmos for the word of God and for this testimony of Jesus Christ. The phrase, I, John, who also am your brother and companion in tribulation, presents the fact that the churches were now undergoing persecution by the Roman emperors. John was the only original apostle remaining, and probably due to his great age, the only human being left alive who had actually been with Jesus. Eusebius mentions that John was banished to the island by the emperor Domitian in A.D. 95 and released 18 months later by Nevera. John at this time no doubt served as the leader of the church and as such Domitian no doubt felt that his imprisonment would put fear into all Christians. The verse begins at some somewhat third introduction in which John again identifies himself and adds further sig significant information about where and when the vision took place together with their divinely appointed destination. John stresses here his intimate identification with the Asian Christians and the reason, reason for his presence on Patmos. The word brother signifies the family of God into which all believers are adopted. It is one might say the greatest fraternity on earth. Now we go to the phrase, and in the kingdom and patience of Jesus Christ. So we started out as, I, John, who, who also am your brother and companion in tribulation, and now, and in the kingdom and patience of Jesus Christ presents the fact that all who are in Christ Jesus are in kingdom, the kingdom of or from the kingdom, which Christ will establish on earth at the second advent. advent. However, even though all born-again believers are presently in this kingdom, it has not yet been established on earth, and it is with patience that we wait for it. The patience mentioned here refers to patient, patient endurance. As we look beyond our immediate distresses and put our full confidence in Christ, we share now in His royal dignity and power. Whether these distresses are imprisonment, Slander, poverty, economic discrimination, hostility, disruption of the churches by false prophets, or even the threat of death, we are to realize our present kinship with Christ in our faithful endurance. Christ's royal power does not now crush opposition, but uses suffering to test and purify the loyalty of his servants. In fact, his strength is revealed through our weaknesses. 2 Corinthians 12 and 19. In much of the modern teaching regarding faith, it is taught that if one has enough of faith, one can forego all problems, etc. While that many sound good to the carnal ear, the facts are such teaching is not found in the Bible. There is no faith that will forego all problems. The truth is these difficulties come because of our faith, not because of a lack of faith. As someone has well said, all faith must be tested, and great faith must be tested greatly. The phrase was in the isle that is called Patmos. So we started out in verse 9. 
I, John, who also am your brother and companion in tribulation, and in the kingdom and in the patience of Jesus Christ, was in the isle that is called Patmos, refers to where John was incarcerated. Tacitus refers to the use of such small islands for political banishment. It is about 10 miles long and 6 miles wide at the north end. On approaching the island, it is said that the coast is high and consists of successions of capes, which form so many ports, some of which are excellent. The only one in use, however, is a deep bay sheltered by high mountains on every side, but one where it is protected by a projecting cape. The town attached to this port is situated upon a high rocky mountain rising immediately from the sea, and this with a harbor below upon the shore consisting of some ships and houses forms the only inhibited site of the island. Though Patmos is deficient in trees, it abounds in flowery plants and shrubs. About halfway up the mountain, there is shown a natural grotto and a rock where John is said to have seen his vision and to have written this book. Eventually, Dimension wanted to silence John without putting him to death. The phrase, for the word of God and for the testimony of Jesus Christ. So we started out, I, John, who was also am your brother and companion in tribulation and in the kingdom, in the patience of Jesus Christ, was in the isle that is called Patmos. And now we are for the word of God and for the testimony of Jesus Christ. Records the reason that John was banished to this particular place. John was not sent to this island to preach the word, but because of religious political opposition to his faithfulness to it. John sees his plight as part of God's design and said, says he is particular says he is a partner with Christians in three things suffering, kingdom, and patience, endurance. John and the Asian believers share with Christ and one another the suffering or agony that comes because of faithfulness to Christ as the only true Lord in God. John 16.33, Acts 14.22, Colossians 1 and 24, 2 Timothy 3 and 12. It is strange that Domitian, the Roman emperor, banishes John to this lonely island because of his allegiance to the word of God and the testimony of Christ, which concludes with John writing the greatest book of prophecy that the world has ever known which is actually the Word of God. And in fact, the Holy Spirit through the Apostle tells Dimension and the countless others like him exactly what their end will be. Verse 10, I was in the Spirit on the Lord's day and heard behind me a great voice as of a trumpet. The phrase, I was in the Spirit, refers to the Holy Spirit moving upon John. More than likely, while he was in prayer, this may sound somewhat unusual to most in the modern church. However, it should not be unusual to any Christian. While that which would happen would be extraordinary as it regards John, and that he would now write the great book of Revelation. Still, this to a degree should be ordinary for all Christians, and I speak of being in the Spirit. Most of the time this happens when one is in prayer, and it is due to a great relationship with Christ. At such a time, the Holy Spirit moves upon the individual, and there is no doubt that it is the Spirit of God. And the thing that is so beautiful and wonderful about this is that God is no respecter of persons. He will bless any believer accordingly if they will cooperate with Him. However, sadly and regrettably, 
the phrase in the spirit is strange to most modern Christians. Most have very little prayer life, if any, and their study of the Word of God is lax as well. In fact, almost non-existent. All, which means their relationship with Christ, is very weak also. Even though the Spirit of God resides in the heart and life of every believer, and irrespective of their spiritual condition, what he does for each person is predicted on several things. Concentration concentration, dedication, and above all, faith in the finished work of what Jesus Christ done at the cross. Now we're at the phrase, on the Lord's day. So we started out as, I was in the Spirit. Now we're on the Lord's day. It refers to the first day of the week, the day of the Lord's resurrection. Matthew 28, 1, John 20, 19, Acts 20 and 7, 1 Corinthians 16 and 2. Some have claimed this phrase on the Lord's Day refers to the coming millennium, etc. However, the text does not lend credence, credence to such an ideal. The day of the Lord is never called the Lord's Day in any passage. The expression Lord's Day came to be used at the time of John for the day set apart to worship the Lord. The term Day of the Lord is found in Isaiah 2.12, 13, 6 through 13, 34 and 8, Joel 1, 15, 2 and 1 and 31, 3, 1 and 21, Amos 5.18, 1 Thessalonians 5 and 1 and 11, 2 Thessalonians 2, 1 and 12. It also refers to the millennium that begins with the second advent and ends at the last rebellion of Satan, Revelations 20, 7 through 10. Consequently, we are not to confuse the two. The Lord's day always refers to the first day of the week, while the day of the Lord refers to the millennium. John states that he was in the Spirit on this particular day. The word translated, translated was, is not from the simple verb of being in the Greek, but from a word that means to become. The experience John had that Lord's Day was not something of ordinary. In fact, it was very extraordinary. He literally became in the Spirit. That is, he entered into a new kind of experience relative to the Spirit's control over him. Peter in Acts 10 and 10 had the same kind of experience. The translators called it a trance. The word trance here is from a Greek word that literally means to stand out of and is brought over into our language in the word ecstasy. The experience which both of these apostles went through was that of being so absolutely controlled by the Holy Spirit that their physical sense of sight, hearing, and feeling were not registered so far as any recognized impressions were concerned. It was as if they were temporary outside of their bodies. The control of the Holy Spirit over their faculties was such that he could give them the visions they had. Peter, the vision of the sheet let down from heaven. John, the prophetic vision of the revelation. The ideal is these were most unusual moving of the, of the Spirit, which resulted in tremendous revelations. The phrase, and heard behind me a great voice as of a trumpet. So we started out. As I was in the Spirit on the Lord's day. And now we are at, and heard behind me a great voice as of a trumpet. Actually means loud as a trumpet. It does not mean that the tones of the voice resemble a trumpet, but only that it was clear, live, and distinct, like a trumpet. A trumpet in those days was a well-known wind instrument designated for the clearance 
of its sounds and was used for calling assemblies together for marshalling hosts or for battle, etc. As John heard the voice behind him and therefore turns about, he beholds the vision that is recorded in our passage, the glorified Christ in the midst of the golden candlesticks. It will be observed immediately that in this vision there are two elements. A. In the first place there is the element of the golden candlesticks, of which it is most natural to assume that they were standing in a circle around the Savior. B. In the second place there is an appearance of the glorified Redeemer, whom John describes in detail. While John had been taken from his beloved flock at Ephesus, with his voice there no longer heard, at least for the period of time he was incarcerated on Patmos, still there was a voice that would reach from the exile of Patmos, not only to Ephesus and its sister churches, but also to all churches and all throughout all time. And in fact, one can say, the mouth that persecution closes, God opens and bids it speak to the world. Truly the voice which John heard heard can you, continues to be heard unto this hour all over the world and has brought joy unspeakable and full of glory to untold millions and let it also be said that this voice still sounds as crystal to all who will take time to listen that concludes revelations chapter 1 verses 9 and 10